Good morning. Uh, sometimes in my church, when there's a particularly compelling children's story, the person who gets up to give the sermon says, well, there's no point in giving my sermon anymore. Everything was said in that children's story. And that's how I feel this morning about the talk. Uh, my talk, the song we just sang, just so beautifully portrayed what I was hoping um, to talk about today. So um, maybe we could just sing that song one more time. <laughs> I'm very honored uh, to be with you this morning. I have to admit, I've never spoken to this kind of group before. I expect that many of you could actually tell me more about compassionate love than I can tell you. But what I can offer today is a psychologist look at compassionate love. I'm a psychology professor at the University of Winnipeg. My area of research is close relationships. Research on compassionate love is actually relatively new in my field. Uh, work in this area got a big boost in 2000 when the Fetzer, Fetzer Institute in the United States decided to launch a funding initiative to promote and understand compassionate love which they broadly defined as giving of oneself for the good of another. So this is a very selfless, other-focused kind of love. And the science director of that institute, Lynn Underwood, developed a theory of compassionate love in which she argued, among other things, that compassionate love, a genuine experience of compassionate love, requires an accurate understanding of the needs and feelings of another person. And then along with understanding where someone is at or what that person's needs are, there is a response of the heart. So it's understanding followed by a heartfelt response. And she went on to say, and I quote her, not everyone will feel gushing emotion when giving compassionate love to another but some sort of emotional engagement is needed to love fully. And the Institute generously provided funding for about 20 of us to conduct research on compassionate love. I collaborated with Susan Sprecher as sociologist at Illinois State University, and one goal of our research program was to develop a scale to measure compassionate love to facilitate scientific research in this area. And in this scale, we really tried to capture the idea of understanding, truly understanding another person's needs, along with feelings of caring and concern and tenderness for the person. And lastly, a desire to help and support others, particularly when we perceive them to be in need or in distress. We developed versions of this scale that you could complete with regard to close other people in your life, or for a specific close other, or for strangers, and even all of humanity. And I'll just give you a sample of some of the findings we've obtained using this scale. The scale was published in 2005. We find, for example, that people who complete the scale with respect to close others in their lives actually provide more support to their loved ones than people who are less compassionately loving. We also find that people who experience compassionate love for strangers or all of humanity are more likely to engage in volunteer work than people who aren't experiencing that kind of love. And perhaps uh, most relevant to this group, we find that people who compassionately love others, uh, particularly who have compassionate love for strangers and all of humanity, that that love is associated with religiosity and with spirituality. I'm um, currently involved in another number of other research projects on compassionate love but I also want to give you a taste of some of the other research that's being done in this area. Recently, a paper was published by Monin and colleagues in which they interviewed elderly people with Alzheimer's disease and their caregiving spouses. 
And what the researchers found was that Alzheimer's patients who felt compassionately loved by their caregiving spouse evaluated the care that they were receiving more positively than those who felt less compassionately loved by their partner. They also found in this study that caregiver burden and caregiver burnout was lowest for caregivers who felt that they were receiving compassionate love from their partner with Alzheimer's. To give you another example of um, ongoing research um, out of University of California, Santa Barbara, Nancy Collins and her colleagues have been doing some beautiful lab experiments on the role of compassionate love in responding to a partner in distress. And their experiments uh, basically follow a paradigm in which uh, couples come into the lab, one partner is left in the lab to do a task, easy or difficult. The other partner is put in an adjoining room to watch what's going on over a video monitor. For the first person who's in the room, they easy, either get an easy math uh, problem to solve, or in the difficult version, they are told to start with the number 2,345 and count backwards by sevens as fast as you can. <laughs> and there's a research assistant in the lab who prompts you to go faster, faster. And if you make a mistake, you have to start over again. <laughs> this turns out to be truly a stressful event for people um, <laughs> when they hook them up to blood pressure monitors and heart rate machines. There's a very clear confirmation that these people are under stress. And what's going on for the partner who's in the next room watching this? What they find is that those partners who are high in compassionate love, they keep their attention focused on the screen, focused on their partner. And they have tried giving those people all kinds of incentives to turn away from the screen. They'll say, there's a really exciting game over here you can play and you can win prizes. The people who are high in compassionate love, they give that up to stay focused on their partner. They also find these uh, partners high in compassionate love experience more empathy for their partner. And at some point in the experiment, they give the uh, partners who are watching the opportunity to send a note to their partner. And they find when they analyze these notes that people who are high in compassionate love send caring, supportive notes to their partners. They say things like, you're doing great. Hang in there, it'll soon be over. <laughs> People who do not feel so much compassionate love send much less caring, supportive notes. They literally say things such as, I had no idea you were that lousy at math. <laughs> And so the um, compassion um, translates into focusing on the other person, experiencing empathy for that other person, and then showing caring, supportive behaviors. I could go on and on about uh, research in this area. I find it really exciting. But I want to um, leave time to talk about a compassionate love challenge or an opportunity to um, foster compassionate love. I have a long-standing friendship with a 35-year-old young man who has autism. And over the years, he has told me heartbreaking stories of not feeling accepted in churches. Um, he will say that if only one person would talk to me, I would feel so much better. And he has really struggled. He feels more accepted at work. But he says, why is it that a church is the place where I feel most alone and where I feel that people reject me because of my disability? And um, he would prefer a church um, with young people and music, like we heard up here, kind of lively music. Uh, for better or for worse, my church does not offer that. Um, but he's decided that he would give up his desire to be in a large church with young people and rock and roll music um, to come to church with me so that 
there will be at least one person who talks to him. And that has led me to really think about the question of the role of compassionate love in welcoming vulnerable and stigmatized people to the church. So is there anything we can do to um, foster or facilitate compassionate love? We don't have an answer to this question yet, at least not in psychology. I'm assuming that's not a standing ovation. It's the one minute mark. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> but there's some preliminary work being done that I'll tell you in less than a minute. Um, with one of my colleagues at the University of Winnipeg, we have done some research where we ask people to write out in detail a time when they experience compassionate love. And we find that following, um, focusing on experience of compassionate love, bringing it to the forefront of your mind, uh, subsequently those people report more positive attitudes towards stigmatized groups. And we don't get that effect if we ask people just to write about a particularly good day you had. Um, it specifically is focusing on compassionate love that has that effect. And so when I'm struggling um, with deficits in compassionate love, I try to put myself in the mindset of remembering an experience of compassionate love, bringing that to the forefront of my mind, and then trying to transfer that into my current situation. So Mother Teresa apparently said compassion begins at home. Um, I would like to extend that quotation to read and hopefully extends to our church communities. Thank you.